Welcome back to another episode of the B2B Zero to 10 podcast. I'm your host, Brett Trainer. Today, I welcome Dan Hill back to the program. Dan is a PhD, author, speaker, trainer, basically an expert in reading emotions and decoding facial expressions. I had Dan onto the program to help us better understand how that works, how you're able to read the expressions, and he basically gives us a mini master class, if you will, on, on how to do this and how to get started. He even calls me out on uh, one of my facial expressions that showed fear. I'm not going to give too much away, but yeah, he's, uh, he's the real deal. And this could be really powerful for you, especially in a digital first, Zoom first world that we're in right now, to better understand what the person on the other side is actually thinking versus what they're saying. So there's a lot of value in the business and personal for this. So I hope you enjoy this episode. And if you do enjoy the podcast, please do share it with a friend and or also subscribe or follow on your favorite podcast platform. Now on to the interview. Hey, Dan, welcome back to the podcast. Oh, absolutely. Thank you, Brett. Uh, It's my pleasure. I was a little surprised when I looked back and realized you were back on episode 56, which was, yeah, I mean, just after the start of the pandemic, I think, which is, which is crazy. So I'm super thrilled to have you back. Good. Yeah, no, the pandemic seems to go on forever. This COVID-19 is, you know, a really out of date term for this pandemic at this point. Exactly. Yeah. It's the new normal, which I hate that term as well, but, you know, and again, what we're going to talk about today is, you know, reading emotions, you know, facial expressions, especially now in the world of Zoom, which we're probably not going back to. So I thought it was a great time to to have you come back and, and help us better learn and understand how to, to leverage that. But before we do, I had to say congrats on the new book. Oh, well, thank it's, you. <laughs> it's really a fun read. It's a little different than your, your other books. What was the, uh, the rationale? Just something you wanted. Was this a passion project for you? Well, what happened is I do a podcast called Dan Hill's EQ Spotlight. And two weeks in a row, unsolicited, I had guests mention that the conservative estimation was that about – 25% of all office managers are bullies. And I was just stunned by that because we spend a lot of money on corporate reorgs and corporate culture. You have Christmas parties. You do all these things to try to create a nice ambiance. And, and obviously, you're trying to protect engagement and productivity of your workforce. But if you've got this emotional cancer sitting in your ranks and you're not addressing it, I mean, that's just terrible for everyone involved as well as the company's bottom line. So my first response after it happened two weeks in a row was, oh my God, and I kind of got mad about it because it's an injustice to everyone who suffers. And I said, well, sometimes the best way to address something is actually using a bit of humor, a little bit of satire to correct an injustice. So one of my favorite books has always been The Devil's Dictionary by Ambrose Spears. He was a contemporary of Mark Twain. And it has funny things like, Dentist, someone who puts metal in your mouth while taking gold from your pocket. (laughs) Or bore, someone who talks when you want them to listen. So anyway, I decided to go that route and I got a lot of collaborators because I don't want to pretend like I know everything that goes down in office politics and office life. And so I got about 50 contributors and it was just, uh, it was a lot of fun, but it also was, you know, trying to have a meaning. Let's let's communicate better. Let's treat people better. Let's be, therefore, more successful as a company because, you know, it's not a terrible thing to go into this particular office to go to work. Right. Yeah. And I, I told you offline before we started just reading it, it brought me back to the, the corporate day. And I think part of it is just it, it's the way it was. It's not an excuse, but yeah, just reading through it. I'm like every one of them at one point or another, right? Those, those definitions made sense. So if anybody out there, you know, has ever spent time in, in the corporate office, or if you enjoy the, as you call it, movie office space or you know, the TV show, the office, you'll really get a, a kick out of the book. And I want to make sure I get the title right. Blah, 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 a snarky guide to office lingo. And it's, exactly. it's, it's, it's fun. And like I said, and if you've never been in the corporate and a lot of our, our audience are, are business owners and founders don't fall into the same trap, right? <laughs> well, at any time you even get more than three people or so, you start having these things happen, quite honestly. Uh, one of my favorite jokes is from Benjamin Franklin who said, three people can keep a secret if two of them are dead. 
<laughs> exactly. Yeah. And, and I like the, again, more sales background marketing, the consultants hit right on it. So anyway, a little off topic for what we wanted today, but I just wanted to tell you, I really, well, that, that's very kind of you. Thank you. So with that being said, in case folks didn't hear episode 56, can you share with the audience just a little bit about your background and what you're working on today? And then we'll, we'll get into the topic at hand. Sure. So you're, you're talking to a, a bootstrapper. Uh, I created my own company called Sensory Logic. I began it in 1998. And the reason was someone I knew at IBM sent over an article about the breakthroughs in brain science and how much people are actually intuitive, sensory, emotional decision makers. We like to think that we're rational actors in the business world, but the truth of the matter is emotions drive a lot of how we behave. And so my specialty was I said, okay, I, I believe that. I think obviously emotions matter a lot. It's not just in sports where you have momentum swings. It's everything in life. And so I wanted a tool that allowed me to scientifically capture, quantify, and understand emotions so they weren't messy that you can actually you know, have metrics here. And so that tool is called facial coding. And I'm the one who brought it into business practice. Uh, now a lot of companies are imitating me as being automated as a software. Uh, but I, I've done work for more than half the world's top 100 companies uh, with a staff that was never more than four people full time. That's awesome. Um, so it was a pretty good success story. And uh, I parlayed that into uh, a number of books as well as national TV appearances and speeches in more than 25 countries. Yeah, fantastic. And I know one of the big things, the, the politics, the, reading the politicians' emotions or facial decoding, right, was, uh, I don't know if you do that all the time or if that was just during the elections you, you do that? I intended to do that during the presidential races. Okay. Um, so, um, you know, yes, I've been on CNN and Fox and MSNBC. Uh, I actually was a, a nonpartisan uh, columnist for Reuters during the 2016 presidential race. So I've really tried hard to do it who the person is. So I'm not looking at party. I'm not looking at their policies. I'm looking at personality. Uh, because yeah. I do think personality still drives what kind of leader you're going to be. And uh, yeah, sometimes I get asked to do it for foreign leaders, other elections, but mostly I've just looked at the U.S. presidential races. I'm fascinated by this. <laughs> and again, even after the last time, started to apply some of that to right, the day-to-day -day interactions and especially in sales, it was incredibly beneficial. And we'll get into some of those best practices. So I thought now would be the good time to have you come back one because, you know, different version of the audience and more more folks. But, uh, you know, in the, the era of Zoom, right, that we're not going yes. back post pandemic, where I think remote and video and distributed between customers, employees is going to be the new normal. So I thought now now would be a good time. How do we make um, not just business owners, but folks in general, you know, smarter about this and have better conversation. So I don't want to lead you too far. So I'd, best place to start with this is maybe, maybe the basics. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Uh, so the basics is that uh, most psychologists would agree we have six core emotions. And, um, you know, can you remember, Brett, what they are? Let's put you in the hot seat for a second. Oh, uh, you are... No, I mean, not cracking. <laughs> I can visualize it, but I'm going to embarrass myself. So, no, no, that, that's quite right. I have at many conferences actually asked people that same question and uh, they struggle with it. And it's funny because there's a there's a really key statement that someone said, which was we have two currencies in business, dollars and emotions. And I bet you anything you can tell the difference between a $5 bill and a $10 bill. And, uh, and yet when we get to emotions, people struggle. It's fundamentally important, but we struggle with them. So those six core emotions are happiness, which is really only the, the only positive of these are pure positive, potentially surprise. And then you have anger and fear and sadness and disgust. And then there's one other emotion that you can pick up uh, through facial coding that might not be called a core emotion, and that's contempt. And why is that important? Because we often say that trust is the emotion of business. And guess what? Contempt is its opposite. I don't trust you. I don't respect you. I find you beneath me. I call it the emotion of bankruptcy and divorce because it doesn't work real well if that's what you're eliciting from others. 
No, that's interesting. Yeah, I was going to guess happiness, but then I would have failed miserably on the the, the next side. And it makes sense. It, it's actually kind of discouraging that of seven emotions, only one's a positive, right? So, well, we, we we hear bad news more loudly because we like to survive. You like your business to survive and thrive, uh, but in all interactions, you have to read the room. You have to know who's with you and who's against you. And human nature is, you know hardwired to really be on guard <laughs> and look out who's who's going to be there for you, but also who's who could stab you in the back or, or fail you at a crucial moment. So it, it's it's survival, survival, survival. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, applying it back to kind of the sales aspect. And I love the two currencies, by the way, I do recall that from our last conversation, because you're right, right? It is emotion. And I think if anything, with this pandemic, maybe it's showed us more that emotions are more powerful than um, the dollars, which you would hope, but it may be, and maybe in the business world, it's coming more to the forefront, right? Because people do care more about their quality of life than the old corporate jobs. But yeah, no, yeah, you're, you're alluding to the, the great resignation as it's being called. We had what 4.4 yeah. 4 million people leave their jobs in September. Uh, it's a, it's a record amount going back for a very long time. And I think, yes, people, we are emotional creatures. And I think people are reflecting on their their value system, their lifestyle, their work life balance. Uh, probably, frankly, going back to blah blah blah, the office politics, <laughs> environment, the, the the nature of the manager they're dealing with, or the startup owner, or whatever. So all of those factors uh, play into this. And yes, I, I think this is, a, if anything, this is more pertinent than ever. And so the key to this is being able to understand, right, not through words, but the, the emotions or the, the facial expressions on, again, I think even if we start, I think last time we talked a lot about sales and, and customers, um, but I think employees now too, right? Because, oh, absolutely. And maybe that's a good way to start. So what's, what's, how do we get master class is another one that could probably fit into your, your book. Sure. <laughs> but if we thought about it, if you're, if you're going to work with me as you're analyzing my emotions now, as we're on this, this, this call, you know, what's, what's a good way for, you know, use me to start to think about this, right. As I interact with partners and employees, even family, what's, you know, what should I be looking out for? Sure. Well, I think, uh, excuse me, the very first place to start is engagement. Because when your emotions turn on, then I have someone who's in motion and active. If you go, I don't want to get all academic on you, but if you go back to Latin, the word motivation and the word emotion have the same root. Move, Ray, to move, to make something happen. So it, whether I am on a pickup basketball game or I'm a startup owner looking between candidates A, B, and C, uh, to join my small crew, and I need each of them to really, you know, work hard on the, on the oars and, and row row us in the same direction together. The very first thing I need to start with is, what's your energy level? Do you care? You know, is is someone home? So with facial coding, you're talking about the fact that human beings have more facial muscles than any other species on the planet. It really is a wealth of possible information there. And so with those 44 sets of muscles, do I see activity? We'll get into specifics of what kinds of activity and which emotions. But first of all, you know, if they are poker faced, if they are blank faced, um, yes, they may be trying to hard hold their cards close to the vest and that sort of thing. Uh, yes, there are times we don't want to give everything away. But I can tell you from even my appearances on TV, looking at psycho killers, those people did not tend to emote very much because they did not care about their victims. Uh, they were they were very much cold blooded. So I want to see a person who is more animated. Uh, that that's the very first thing I'm looking for. I, I don't want someone who's dead in the water. Yeah, it's interesting you started or, or led with that because I had a guest on yesterday, Eva Nahari. She's a VC. And when you're talking about the first thing that she's looking for in potential businesses she's investing in is it's the people. And she wants to see that that motivation, that commitment, that energy, because if they don't have that energy to start, then you shouldn't even want any, any part of the business. So that, that one's not published, but it will be. But it's, it's interesting. That's exactly what you're saying is is number one. <laughs> yeah. And, and I remember I took a guy named Andrew on my staff at one point and of the candidates I had, he was the smartest, I felt, 
and he was a smart guy, but he was, as I said a moment ago, pretty cold blooded. So it was kind of like dancing on the razor's edge. I, I got the smarts from him, but I didn't get someone who was really there for me. And, uh, you know, I had to balance those two things and it wasn't, it wasn't that much fun, you yeah. know, because that, that emotional chemistry day after day in the office, when you have someone who's kind of cold and kind of flat affect, it, it just wears on you. Yeah, no. And I've become a much bigger believer in, in that as well. Right. Transitioning back from the corporate side where you had a job to do, you do your job and it's just, it's the way it was, but now it's having that the same I don't want to say the same like-minded people, but again, people with the same energy pushing the same direction is going to build the culture of an organization, right? I mean, that's what yeah. you get. Well, I, I, would say, I would say, I would say like-minded and I would say like-hearted. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's okay to have a different opinion, but you got to be all pushing. You use that row in the boat in the same direction. Yeah. I mean, yeah. have the conversation, air the ideas, but once you make a decision, you want the person with you as to where you're headed. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the energy one makes sense. I'm completely on board with that. Now it's probably easy to see because they're going to be engaged and and energetic about it, right? So, yeah. So so let's go maybe to happiness next because that is the one positive. So so let, let's start there. Uh, I think the most important thing is there's a distinction. Uh, a true smile is where the muscle around the eye constricts and you get the twinkle in the eye. So, of course, the company that staked its value proposition on happiness is none other than Disney. Yeah. You know, that they wanted to make Disneyland the happiest place on earth. Well, if you're really going to make people happy, you have to get to joy. And that's when you get the twinkle in the eye. Otherwise, you get what's called a social smile, which is when the muscle, you know, you get the, the smile that involves, you know, the lifting of the corners of the mouth and it affects the cheeks as well. And that can be fine, but I would tell you as an employer, I would look for, you know, how much of a rise do I get? Uh, what's the strength of the smile? Uh, because a really tepid smile, you know, is like a toehold. It's like a begrudging acceptance. And uh, that also gets a bit wearing over time, if that's as far as that person gets to. Uh, but in all fairness, I would say that every emotion has an upside and a downside. So I think we can see the obvious benefits to happiness. This is an approach emotion. It means I am coming towards you. I, if you're, you know, the employee and I'm working with a startup owner, you know, I embrace the idea you have of what we're trying to do with this company. So I, I am embracing, hugging, moving toward uh, it's, there's evidence to show that people who are happier tend to be more creative. They, they brainstorm better to superior solutions and more quickly. So lots of upsides. Happiness is not a trivial emotion. Yeah. Um, on the other hand, to be fair, happiness does have a potential downside. Happiness can also mean that you relax. And when you relax, you may not pay attention to the details. And, you know, we both know in business, there are a lot of details to be taken care of. Yeah. yeah. And so, um, you know, the, the happy camper, uh, <laughs> you know, life of the party is, is the person you might want to date, but not marry. Um, you know, so you, you have to be a little a grain of salt there just to play it safe. I, I would say some joy is great because of the creativity. I would say that really tepid, bar barely a smile is not so wonderful. But they should be across the range and, you know, they shouldn't just be you know, out of their mind, you know, happy go lucky, <laughs> you know, trivializing everything because, you know, this is the lifeblood of your, your company right. and, and they need to take care of those details. I think that's super interesting because you're right. I, we've all been in that position where we just smile as the, the courtesy and that's never really thought about it in the, the business sense. But yeah, if you've got an employee that just nods and, and smiles, you may think, hey, perfect, they're on board, but they're actually probably unhappy, but just giving you the, so if you don't see bouts of that, right, or periods of it, you're right, it's not going to be all the time, but you'd hope at some point in the engagement that you would get that. Yeah, no, my, my father was in charge of 3M printed post-it notes, production, sales, and marketing. He said, the toughest place to go to for me was Japan, he said, because I would get all these smiles, and let's let's say there's 50 variations. He said, I knew 47 of them probably actually meant no, 
or maybe. <laughs> uh, and my job was to ferret out which ones meant I really had someone who was accepting, you know, the mandate of where I wanted to take things. Now, that's really interesting and great to know. I mean, it's a, it's an easy tip. I mean, I obviously practice makes perfect, but yeah, if you're actually paying, which goes back to the bigger problem with our society is we just don't pay attention, right? We're always talking instead of listening, but now listen with your eyes as well as just with, with your ears. Is that fair? Yeah, no, there, there's a study, a very important study uh, historically done out of UCLA by a professor named Albert, Albert Mabarian. And he said that in ambiguous situations, you know, the, the verbal input in terms of what's really going on is like about 8%. And, and the rest comes from the face and the voice. So, yeah, if, you know, if your listeners read have never been lied to in life, you know, congratulations to them. Yeah. <laughs> uh, otherwise, there's always the risk of lip service. Uh, and so, yes, not only do you look for the smile, but you should look for even potentially the rhythm of the smile. When someone, you know, does the light bulb smile and it's too quick, or they do what I call the uh, the guillotine smile where it just drops off their face at the end. That's not natural. That's that's kind of a more of a forced smile because yeah. any expression should be like a wave that gathers as a peak and breaks on the shore. It should gather, reach a peak and, and let go. And it should be probably over a time frame of about, you know, one to four seconds. That, that's a natural smile. As you mentioned, I, I've also done work looking at the politicians and naturally in the debates, they have debate coaches and they have these endless smiles, kind of like the Energizer bunny of smiles yeah, 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 that yeah. just go on and on, even if they're getting hammered by their opponent. And, you know, they're trying to put a brave face on things, but are those real smiles? No, those are not real smiles. Which is, again, this is, could be such a powerful tool for, for people, right? Because I guess I'm guessing 80, 90% of the folks watching those debates would say, yeah, maybe he's putting on a smile, but they're not thinking, right? The real thoughts behind, right? What that smile actually, actually means. And yeah, you know, and, and authenticity is everything. Yeah, you know, we, you know, I, I think in, in sales and who you hire, trying to avoid lip service, I mean, we want someone who's, not just says they're there for us, but actually is there for us. That's why the authenticity matters. That's why you have to, you have to take the, the smiles and, and, and give them a little bit of attention. Uh, you know, we use smiles to camouflage a, a great deal. And so if you're going to be a good detective. Then you got to realize the smile, you know, not all smiles are the same. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, t- take note. That makes makes sense. And as you as you're talking, I'm thinking about the different facial expressions. We've all been on a sales calls before, right? And you've got three or four different potential buyers or one company that you're surrounded, and you've probably got one of everything. Yeah. <laughs> there, and I think I think that that could be insightful. How would you let's say you're the salesperson? You're you're pitching a a, a new company, and you've got a you know three or four folks from that. Uh, prospective buyer, you know, what are you going in? What are you looking for? Um, I'm just really kind of curious. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I think we're going to have to get into the other emotions, obviously, okay. to answer right, that me, question. But, but, but let me take it just in terms of happiness for a moment. I mean, I would like to, if I think it's going well and I got a person, hopefully it's the key person who's a bit on board, I also actually want to look at what's the trigger. What, what is causing those those moments, those bursts of smiling, because those are the touch points or the talking points that are being turned into feeling points and connect you with that person. You want to build momentum. You know, you want yes, yes. And the final, yes, I sign off on the project. Right. Um, so what, what are the small yeses that get you to the final big yes and, and repeat them, reiterate them, uh, embellish them, ask them what they like about that, draw them out a bit. Um, you know, that, that happiness is all about, it's kind of like nature's version of a neon, you know, open for business sign in the front window of the store. Um, so, you know, keep the lights on, so to speak. Yeah, I, I like that. And true, even, you know, people buy from people, right. And the emotionally connected, I think makes sense, right. If you just came in with your plain pitch and say, Hey, here's the features and the benefits we're going to, it's never going to connect with them. Even maybe, maybe, maybe if you hit a, a huge pain point of theirs and your solution is going to solve it, but unless you get kind of the emotional 
to your, I think you said trigger around it, that's when you yeah. really are going to see the, the benefit. Most businesses struggle having differentiation that's substantial uh, or maintaining it if they did have it because they'll have imitators. Uh, what they can imitate is the strength of the personal connection that you can forge with somebody. And so even if you have differentiation, it's nice to have, you know, two, two cylinders uh you know the offer and the personal connection if you don't have the offer that's you know that strong that uh prevailing then you know it really does come back to the personal connection yeah interesting okay all right and, and, and there's always there's always a service component to any offer you know in, in some fashion so it, it's pertinent there too but they want to feel good about the person they're buying from because yes, they're representing they the brand and confidence and yeah, yeah, you you are the embodiment. Whether you're a startup business, then you are you are very much the brand. Uh, if you're if you've grown to a mid-sized company by chance or beyond, uh, you know, brand is you, you are the ambassador for the brand on that occasion. Yeah, which you know, it's interesting. I know I keep taking this off topic a little bit, but you know, I've had more and more folks where I thought maybe it was just a coincidence and who I was having on the podcast, but business owners, you know, they are one in the same with their their business, right? They and sure. you know, we throw around personal brand too much, but they're not launching their company as just XYZ company. It, this is my company. They're hiring people around that person's vision for the company. And I think there's those days of like an IBM, right? Or it's going to be much harder to grow that today without that emotional connection to the leader, the owner, and then tying it back to the business. Well, and, and it is, and that's another reason to discuss happiness before we move on to the other emotions. Um, yeah, you know, I'm at work at a, a new book or actually uh, a 15th anniversary edition of my probably most notable book called Emotionomics. And the, the big switch there uh, when I was asked by, you know, literary agents and publishers and so forth is that when I wrote the book 15 years ago, of course, the target readers were boomers and Gen X. If you look at the data now for millennials and Gen Z, they're going to be about 70% of the workforce within about four to five years here. So really quickly. Wow. And they are tremendously oriented around the values, not, not just the value proposition, the values proposition of what is your brand about? What are you trying to do? How are you trying to not just sell and stay in business, but is there something that benefits society? Um, are you inclusive? Are you worried about the environment? You're, you're, you're green. And all those things can be, you know, lip service promises right. by, by owners. But, you know, from the data, if it's to be believed, for a lot of those people that you're going to need to hire as employees, you know, are increasingly going to become your customer base, they want a sense of what your brand is about and they do want to embrace it, which means you need to make them feel positive and happy about what your brand stands for. And if you're a small business, uh, it's still the same thing. I mean, they're, they're joining your ship. It, it flies under a flag. And, um, you know, if it can be a smiley face flag, that's probably a lot better. Than going through the motions flag. Going through the motions or, you know, skull and crossbones and they think they've gotten on a, on a death ship and they'll, they'll put up with it for a bit because they need a job. But, you know, they're, they're not going to be there for you. You're going to have a turnover problem. Yeah, I think growth is going to be tied. You talk about the small businesses growing, right? It's you know, one of the things I talk about. Now I'll have science behind it is, <laughs> right, if, you, if, if one, if the owner isn't, passionate about the problem they're solving or the business they're doing, it's going to be really hard to get employees that are passionate about that same problem or that same business. And if they're not passionate about it, it's going to be really hard to get customers convinced if, if the folks that are engaged with it every day aren't, aren't excited about it. And I used to, like I said, back in the day, that seemed more like it was lip service. You could just sell anyway because people needed the product. It didn't matter necessarily what the brand behind it, but I don't know. I don't encourage, I encourage all the business owners to find that you had to have that passion that you're, you're solving or it's going to be twice as hard to, to grow your business. Sure. But then I, let's go to two other emotions. Speaking of that passion. Okay. Um, and, and then what I would go to next is, is fear and anger because you do want to have the passion that you just alluded to, but it can't be that it suffocates your employees. 
And I'm going to talk very much in terms of uh, a startup audience where you have maybe 10 employees or fewer. Yeah. Because you, we all know you, you got to have the revenue. As Mark Cuban says, profits create possibilities. You, you got to have money coming in the door. So you can have a passion about, you know, staying solvent, taking the business forward, growing it. But believe me, your employees are going to be looking really closely at you because they want to know that their livelihoods and their ability to cover the rent, the mortgage and everything else, you know, isn't in jeopardy. So I think we need to go next to fear. Okay. Because with fear, it means that, you know, if, if you feel overwhelmed by the circumstances, if you feel threatened, uh, it's classic. You will fight, you will freeze, or you will flee. Now, the owner, quite honestly, has no choice but to fight because it's their company, their money, their time, their vision, their effort. They're in the battle. If, however, the employees can see that the owner is fearful of failure, they don't necessarily have to choose to fight. They might choose to flee. Right. And if they don't flee, because maybe they don't have the energy to go look for a new job or whatever, or they're hoping it's a passing phase, well, then they might freeze. Freeze does not help the owner and move things forward. So that's why I said that's the caution around you feel the passion, but you got to project some confidence. You, you've got to, you know, not always have the foot, the gas pedal down full bore because if the car is speeding and you're asking them all to be in a car that's going 120 miles an hour, they might be afraid that you, you lose control of the wheel and you all end up in the ditch and you're dead. Um, so I think it's really, you have to be careful here. And, and I can say this, you know, I'm not trying to, take the high road and preach and be condescending. I, I can put myself right in that situation. I can remember at one point I said, well, because I thought it would be nice for the, the chemistry of the crew I had on, on the, in the company at the time, I, I made an extra hire. And I didn't really quite want to do it, but I thought it might help with people's workloads and socially, but it meant I was carrying an extra salary when I didn't really want to. And the bargain I made with them was, that I need you to step in and assist me a bit more on the sales part. And what I was finding was it wasn't terribly happening, especially for the person I had just added. So I made a mistake one day uh, in front of all three of the people that I was really trying to address. I made a comment where, you know, I emphasize with passion <laughs> that you <laughs> need to put a little more effort into this. You can't just say I, I made my obligatory 15 calls and, and I'm done for the day. And now I can check out of that part of that and go on to my other duties, which are less onerous for me. What I should have done is take the one person who was, frankly was the problem, who was the most lax. And I should have talked to that person separately. Yeah. Because by showing a little bit of, not so much fear in my case, probably actually a little bit of anger or frustration, one of those people was probably the best salesperson I ever had. And she eventually left the company. And I think that moment when I didn't quite handle it adroitly enough cost me a really good employee. Whereas if I had taken the worst one, who did eventually leave anyway, if I had taken him aside, if I ran a risk of losing him, so be it. <laughs> right. Um, so there was fear underneath that because obviously I don't want to go in the red. I want to be making money, not losing money. Right. So there was certainly a fear there, but it's really common for us as human beings to mask fear with anger because fear also frightens us. Yeah. <laughs> we don't want to be there. It's uncomfortable to be afraid. And one of our recourses as human beings is to instead uh, try to leave, relieve the burden of discomfort by going on the offensive, by getting angry. But anger as an emotion means that I'm, I'm striking out. If, if the essence of happiness is to hug, the essence of anger is to hit. So they're both approach emotions. They're both really common emotions. And used correctly, anger is a wonderful emotion, actually. It can mean that I want to be in control of my destiny, that I want to make progress, that I want to break through barriers. Those are the upsides. The downsides is that anger can sometimes show in our face because we're confused. Our, our eyebrows knit together. You know, that's usually or very often 
either a sign of bafflement or, you know, just outright confusion and, and I'm lost. You, you might be focused, but it, it could be the, the confusion. Uh, but you, you want it to be the, the upside elements of, of anger where it can really be an energizing emotion, but not one where you're hitting out and driving people away from you. Interesting. And that's true whether it's employees or, or obviously customers. You can't, you know, if you got a prospect and you want them to close and they're taking forever and hemming and hawing, I, I think you and I would both know you're going to feel some frustration there. Um, 100%. They don't care about your frustration. <laughs> they're going to continue hemming and hawing. And if you press them too hard, they're probably just going to revert to fear and flee. And so that's why I think the dynamic between fear and and anger is such an interesting one and such an important one for business owners or for anyone in business uh, to navigate and to recognize. Uh, guys in particular, sometimes the masculine code is we don't want to admit we're afraid. Right. But guess what? We're human beings. Uh, we, we, do, we do fear rejection. Uh, you know, it, it happens. Yeah, I never thought, I mean, it makes perfect sense now that you're explaining it, the fear and anger piece, right? It is a natural reaction. If we can keep that under control, maybe a little bit better, it's going to be a, a, a huge benefit, especially to your point, if directing at others, right? And it's because if you're fear, you're directing anger at others, that's probably not going to end well. Sure. And the most reliable indication of fear, because fear and surprise show very similarly on the face because Human beings don't like to adjust to situations and we wonder whether we're up to it. So the, the most natural thing is for us to feel afraid. But when something new happens, we will feel surprised because it's new. Uh, and then we can often, you know, translate that over into fear because, oh, my God, uh, can I it's handle it? <laughs> yeah, it's new. What am I going to do about it? So um, just to be honest, like when I asked you what the six core emotions are, uh, you showed fear on your face. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I'm the, sure I did. And the way you showed it was that the, the in your case, the left side of your mouth, uh, it pulled wide for a moment in kind of an e-gas expression. Uh, because sometimes we'll show an emotion unilaterally. I mean, when I said 44 muscles, that's two sets of muscles, uh, left side, right side of the face. And sometimes it will show on both sides of the face. Sometimes it might just happen on one side of the face. So in your instance, that, that fear expression, you know, came particularly oh, strongly on the left side of your face. Uh, it wasn't much evident on the right side. I have to go back and watch the video after this. And <laughs> <laughs> it's got to be hard. But sometimes ignorance can be bliss, right? You don't want to know what the other person's like. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right. So what, what else do what else we, we've got through? Uh, what's next? Well, I, I think we should really talk about contempt. Because it is, uh, it's a fascinating and, and dangerous emotion. So let's reiterate, first of all, the stakes involved. We, we would all agree that trust is the emotion of business because right underneath trust is loyalty. If I trust you, I will be loyal. You know, you might not be the smartest boss. You might be, not be the biggest company. But if I trust you, there's a really good chance I'll hang with you. Um, you know, I, I played a lot of sports in my day, and I, I will take a teammate who I think is earnest and trying over one who I think maybe has a little bit more skill, but isn't really, you know, putting it out there on the playing field. Uh, they're, they're kind of skating through, through the game. You know, that, yeah. that, 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 that's, that's a frustrating circumstance. So contempt is odd because it's almost like an attitude as much as it's an emotion. We can feel contempt right in the moment when some, someone says something, we go, ah, that's BS. So th there can certainly be the immediate trigger. But because we're talking about trust, it can also build up over time. You know, they said this, but they did that. So <laughs> when they did that, which wasn't what they said, then I lost a little bit of trust. And then it happens a second time and a third time. So, you know, a lot of the emotions, they just happen. And they're in that moment. But I really think that trust is kind of like a bank account. And are you overdrawn yeah. or not? And, it, and it, it has a time frame to it that makes it different potentially from the others. So really fundamentally, there's only one way to look for a lack of trust. Um, and it's all around the mouth. Well, two actually. What, the most central one is you smirk. The corner of the mouth goes up and out. There's a tension to the corner of the mouth. 
Uh, think of the cartoon character Snidely Whiplash. That that person by name is kind of the embodiment of lack of trust, of smirking. The other way is if the upper lip curls, but only on one side of the face. It does it unilaterally. Uh, but that will also show disgust and anger. So that's not just the contempt. The smirk is contempt alone. So if you provoke contempt, a smirk, uh, in a sales situation, obviously you just put yourself behind the eight ball. <laughs> Um, can you recover from it? I'm not sure you can because it's a really a fundamental judgment about your character is really what it comes down to. Essentially, you know, you lied to me. Yeah. You, you know, you, you weren't worthy of my respect. Uh, if I'm hiring somebody and I see a smirk, uh, that's interesting and worth exploring. Is it a smirk? And if they have it with a smile, like Tom Brady smirks a lot. Bill Gates smirks a lot. Well, they're really talented. And in being really talented, they're also really confident. And so I have seen a smirk and a smile go together. And if it's confidence, that can be a wonderful thing to add to my staff. However, it can also be true that it can signal arrogance. And there's a really fine line oh, yeah. between confidence and arrogance. All you'd have to do is ask Melinda Gates. She, she divorced the guy. Why did she divorce him? Because she felt condescended to. You know, it's um, not fun to be condescended to. No, not at all. And uh, it wears on people and they will, they will leave in time. Interesting. And so, you know, what's the balance? How frequent is it? What's the behavior that goes with it? Yeah, because someone who's arrogant probably doesn't compromise very well. And life, invo life involves compromises. Collaboration and compromise. Yeah, but, <laughs> but confidence, on the other hand, makes me feel like I'm prepared to put my idea out there. I think it's a good idea. If you see its merits, that's great. If you modify it a bit, I'm confident but not arrogant. So I'm accepting that we'll, we'll, we'll adjust it. You know, my idea maybe wins, but maybe not in its original format. You can work with confidence. Arrogance is a lot harder to work with. Yeah. No, so in hiring an employee, that's what I want to investigate. Who do I really have? So if I see the smirk, you know, which one of those is it? And then also what was the, what provoked it? Was it a, a part of the job description that, uh, mm -hmm they think is beneath them? Is it something they think they can really hit it out of the park? <laughs> you know, which, which one of those two was it? Uh, is, is it an office procedure? Um, you know, what, what, what provoked it? So I think if you see it, you, it you're, it's really incumbent on you as an owner to investigate what caused it. Now, I'm not suggesting you say, hey, you just smirked. <laughs> you know, tell me why. That, that's, that's a little too blunt <laughs> and obvious, but I think you got to, maybe not even in the moment, but at some point in the conversation, you got to circle back and try to figure out what's, what, unpack it a bit, what's going on there. And, yeah. and, and, that, and that's your opportunity to know better who you've got and what their capabilities are going to be and what their attitude is going to be on behalf of you and the company. That's fantastic. And you could use this in your personal life with your spouse to probably help you communicate better. If I, I think I applied some of that after the last time I need to stick with it because I, I don't know if I ever get, I'm sure I get smirks <laughs> from my wife. <laughs> now I can actually start to read where she's, what's upsetting her at, at, at some point. Sure. And, and the stakes are, aren't small there because the love lab at the university of Washington, Seattle uses facial coding in marriage counseling. Really? With okay. 15 minutes of videotape, a 90% accuracy rate as to whether or not the couple will stay married. Wow. And, and smirks are the most reliable indicator that it will fail. Interesting. That makes sense. I mean, when you say yeah. it, it just makes perfect sense. Um, who is there? was a gymnast a number of years ago, women gymnast, really good, that famously got caught with that smirk. Um, F, during the competition, I don't know if it was the judges or what it was. I mean, she's actually made commercials out of it afterwards. And it was, yeah, you could just see the the contempt on, with, with that little action. Now, hers was exaggerated, obviously, but 
Yeah, no, it, it's, you know, it's, it may not be one of the six core emotions, but it might, on the other hand, be the most important of the emotions that you can capture through facial coding. Yeah, no, this is absolutely fascinating. And I could, I could talk to you for an hour about this, and that's hard, <laughs> but, I, but I know I've taken, taken a lot of your time. So is there anything else you want, do you think we should cover to, to close this out? And then I want to get to where people can start to study and learn more about this. Um, I think the only other emotion I would touch on briefly is sadness, um, because sometimes we will deride sadness. And it's true that sadness can, uh, you know, indicate that someone is low energy, um, you know, they can slow them, slow them down, they're kind of despondent, they've given up. Um, and, you know, if they have given up potentially, then I think as an owner, you have to look and say, what did I do? Did I leave them feeling like they didn't get enough support? Is there something in the office environment where they are feeling excluded? Because we, we all want to belong. We all, right. we, we all want to feel appreciated. We all want to feel like we're being supported. So I think if you see that emotion, which most classically is the corners of the mouth going down, kind of like a rodeo clown, they could, it could also be a wince in the cheeks, for instance. Okay. Or the eyebrows pull up and, and tight together. Those are all signs of sadness, potentially. Um, the upside of sadness, because as I, I pointed out, every emotion has an upside and a downside. Um, the upside of sadness is that it can also be someone who's going to um, ponder things more. They, they can be okay. a little more thoughtful because sadness and slowing you down also means you're not rushing into the next mistake as quickly. So if you're always happy, happy camper, happy go lucky person trips over themselves and doesn't take care of the details, uh, the so-called sad sack, which is, you know, kind of a pejorative term, obviously, but the sad sack may be the opposite. They may actually be careful not to trip over the really details. Careful. Yeah. And so, um, you know, in the right measure, the right degree of it, um, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't dismiss that as actually potentially even a positive attribute in an employee, even though it seems to be a quote unquote, a negative emotion. Yeah. And it's just no, you're no, no people. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's, it's yeah, I mean, it's, but, but reading it, I'm just curious. I don't, we didn't, we're well, stressed. It, well, well, I'll give you an example. Our greatest president was really characteristically a combination of sadness and happiness. Uh, you know, Lincoln had the ability to think through situations, to be creative, to assess the people around him. Um, you know, and he had a very good sense of humor, actually, including putting himself down. But he was also a very really sad person in many ways. He was facing a horrendous conflict in the country. He had a son die while he was in the White House. He had a wife who went into depression as a result. Uh, you know, Lincoln had faced lots of uh, travails in his life. He was not he was a he was a very sad person in many ways. He just managed to leaven it with enough humor and happiness to make it work for him. To balance. So, yeah, so it's, it's a lot that's in the, in, is in the balance, just as you said. And again, one of the things I'm thinking about employees, right? Stress is, it can't be good, but it's not really emotion. How do you, how do you look for stress or what is, how do we think about that? Uh, well, I mean, I, I think one thing is, you know, stress is, can bring on fear. Uh, because, you know, we're, we're not comfortable, <laughs> we're discomforted, uh, we're under the gun. Uh, but I think the, the long-term impact is that they'll just stop engaging as much. We started this conversation around engagement right. and, and energy level. And human beings can rise to a crisis, but if the crisis is ongoing, eventually it just wears them out. Right. Kind so of like this pandemic is doing to us, right? <laughs> um, very much so. Very much right. so. I mean, this is, you know, I mean, I just was traveling across the country from St. Paul to California. I couldn't believe how many people didn't have masks on. I mean, it's like everyone said, I I'm tired of this. So, so I I I'm done with it. Um, and obviously, people have different politics and viewpoints, but I, I can tell you that uh, we may be tired of COVID, but it's not tired of us. Right. I mean, it, it's still happening. And um, but yes, we, we do wear out as people. Um, we, we, we have thresholds. We can only take so much typically for most of yeah. us. Yeah. Yeah. So for sure. Dan, this is always so insightful. And if people do want to learn more and, and get better at 
you know, the engagement and recognizing the facial expressions. Where's, where are some good resources? What's the what best way to get started? Sure. Well, what I've been trying to cover in part, but it's all captured nicely in my book, Famous Faces Decoded, a guidebook for reading others, which uses celebrity examples, including from Hollywood and sports and rock music and so forth uh, to, you know, to make it more fun. But it, it's got visuals, it's got diagrams, uh, it's got stories involving celebrities and emotions. Um, so th that's easily the best resource based on what we talked about today. Uh, then you very kindly speaking of happiness, I tried to offer some to people's lives. So the book, Blah, 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 Starkey Guide to Office Lingo is also available on Amazon. And I think those are the two key books to start with. Um, they might be able to find some uh, used copies of Emotionomics still out there, but uh, a new edition is forthcoming. Yeah, when do you think that's going to be out? I don't want to put your... Oh, yeah, well, you know, the, pub the publishing industry is uh, uh, a 19th century industry. It, it moves really slowly. So my agent's telling me that the earliest we can hope for is spring of 2024. Oh, wow. Okay. So, yeah, we'll have to have you back on a few times before then to keep us educated and, and pushing forward in, in that realm. So, sure. Well, thank and you. If, and if people want to connect with you, what's the best way for them to do that? Sure. Uh, my email is simple. It's D for Dan, D Hill. And my company is called Sensory Logic, as in your five senses. So D Hill at sensorylogic.com. And uh, yes, I do private consulting. I do uh, training things that I can pull off for, for companies or for sales forces or whatever. Um, it, it's all It's all possible. Awesome. Yeah, we'll make sure we'll link all of that in the show notes so people can find you. And as, as always, Dan, appreciate the time. Um, it's fascinating. I mean, it's it, it seems it could be a superpower that should people more people should be using, but they don't. So uh, this is your call to action to go and, and get better. And it's just going to make you a better communicator if you can understand. So thank you. <laughs> sure. No, absolutely. Thank you. All right, Dan, we'll talk, we'll catch up with you in the not too distant future. So I appreciate it. Mm -hmm.